I'm going to call the um, Monday, January 28th school committee meeting to order at 7.02. And is there any public comment for items that are not on the agenda? The agenda includes the um, budget presentation and an update on kindergarten. Those are our two agenda items. Um, we have a consent agenda. I move to approve the consent agenda. <coughs> Second. Se seconded by Mr. Boyden. And all those in favor? Okay. That's five zero. Um, we have warrants going around, and there's also a um, uh, another note from our Mrs. Vandenacker. Dr. Van Den Acker. <coughs> Get that. Uh, okay, so we're going to do our reports and we will start with Maura. So there's been many, many events going on at the high school recently. So the chess this week, Army chess student Eamon Langlois was a newly published author. So congratulations to Army chess senior Eamon Langlois for becoming a published author. His short story, Her Books, written for Miss Crosby's Creative Writing Senior Elective Course, was selected for publication in the Canvas Teen Literary Journal. Also this week, RMHS students participated in the Memory Project. So teacher Sue Gilbert, her OEP art students, and the RMHS Art Club participated in the Memory Project this year. The project involves art teachers, artists, and students in creating portraits for refugee children throughout the world. This semester, our art club and AP art students worked with refugee children in Rohingya, Myanmar, who have fled genocide in Myanmar and have been re relocated to the world's largest refugee center in Bangladesh. Lastly, John Hardy receives the High Five Award. Recently, senior John Hardy was recognized for his success both inside and outside the classroom through the High Five Award. John is a high achieving student who assigns honors accounting with Ms. Lynch and honors psychology with Ms. Fidelli as his current favorite classes. John is also president of the Spanish Club and a current member of the National Honor Society. Congratulations, John. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have, Dr. Darty, do we have any reports from staff? Yeah. One. Yep. Um, I did put together a memo to the legislature. Um, at your urging regarding our circuit breaker formula. So a few of the highlights um, that, you know, I'll review with John for him to submit on behalf of the district, but really urging them to fully fund it at what's in the legislature at 75%. That's a, a standard uh, memo that I think the Mass <laughs> Association of School Superintendents and my professional organization are jointly urging, but then I included some additional paragraph, probably three or four, relative to a re-examination of the formula, just urging them to really go back to the original proposal where back in 2004, um, the original proposal had in it for districts to be able to seek reimbursement at three times the foundation formula as opposed to four for in-district programs. So mm -hmm. that would enable us to really um, file claims on behalf of the many students not every one, but many of our students in our district-wide specialized programs. And I did note that in Reading, we have 141 students placed in such programs. Not everyone would qualify, and this isn't meant for the legislature to look at that and think, wow, that would be a real bonanza, because it wouldn't be. It's more just, it might be a couple thousand dollars here, a few thousand dollars there that we'd be able to then seek reimbursement for. And that every, every dollar we can get in only helps us helps with this escalating cost that is such a problem for the budget overall. So that's the essence of the memo, mm -hmm. and then once we finalize the, the wording, you know, we'll share it with the school committee and send that off. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I would like to, on behalf of the committee, basically send a letter be, through the, to the legislator, legislature, uh, or our legislators, all three of them, I'm guessing, and um, so I can look and see what MASC, if MASC has a letter, and also take that letter as a reference. So I will, I'll take care of that on behalf of the committee as well. Um, if I can just add one thing yep. to that. So today also we signed a petition uh, through MASS for uh, 
very similar to the letter that Mrs. Stewart just brought up. There were over 200 signatures of superintendents from districts at that time that we sent it, so. Did you have another report, Dr. Darty, or is it? Right? I Chris does, and then I do. Brief uh, report. Mm. So um, on March 22nd, we're going to have our all-day professional development day, which formerly had been the uh, Blue Ribbon Conference. Uh, this year, we're actually rebranding it a bit, and it, it will be known as the Reading Institute Spring Edition. Um, and we're focusing on all of the Reading Institute days and even some graduate courses this summer on things that uniquely pertain to Reading and things that we're working on. So this day we're very excited to announce that it's going to be focused on equity and diversity. So we have a fabulous keynote speaker already um, booked for the day, Dina Simmons uh, from Yale, um, Yale University, and she speaks about diversity and equity uh, and in particular, her number one focus is on the imposter syndrome, oh. which uh, definitely resonates in our community with mm -hmm. um, communities like ours that don't have a tremendous amount of diversity that kids often try to fit in by, uh, you know, really um, not being who they want to be or feeling like they can be. So we're excited about it. I'm busily planning uh, workshops on that theme. It'll be in the pathways this week a little bit about it. And I also plan our uh, learning and teaching team is sending out a winter newsletter to all the staff this week, which I will send along to you as well uh, with updates from our office, uh, sort of district-wide updates, but a special blurb about this day and really uh, asking if folks have ideas. Um, we're really focusing on bringing key people in, um, some from in the district, but a lot from out of the district that have done a lot of work on equity and diversity. So we're really, really excited about it. Um, uh, thank you to um, our principal at the high school, Kate, for giving me a gentle nudge a few months ago to start thinking about this. Not that we weren't really focused on it, but we had decided to really focus this entire day district-wide on this important theme and really start building our toolboxes together on how we deal with this as a community. And we're really excited about it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Darty. So I have two things. Uh, one is a re request has been made if we would all speak into our microphones like Mara did. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, the, the because room? the acoustics and people oh, in the okay. back can't hear us. There um, are plenty of seats up front, though. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, other, the other piece I wanted to add, um, Mrs. Dowd and I uh, went with uh, Deputy Chief Clark, uh, Bob Olashore, uh, Lieutenant Detective Abadi, our two school resource officers, Jane Miller and Matt Cornelis, um, to meet with Marion Ryan, the district attorney, today. This meeting was actually set up several weeks ago um, as a result of the ongoing graffiti incidents that we were having in our community at the time. And um, through conversations with the town manager, uh, District Attorney Ryan suggested that we all meet and just talk about are there other things that we could be doing? Are there uh, things that the district attorney could offer uh, us in terms of programs and services? So um, we did meet today for a probably a good hour. Um, and that we, we did come up with some thoughts and ideas that uh, in terms of some maybe some community pieces, but also some, uh, some uh, programs that the district attorney's office offers for free which is always a good thing for students. So we're going to be pursuing those a little bit further um, and looking at a community event, most likely in, during the March time frame. So we're working on some dates right now and, uh, and some of the other programs too. I'll be speaking to the building principals about. Great. Thank you, Dr. Darty. Ms. Sprowski. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a bit of a lengthy report tonight for the committee, but I'm really excited about it. The Reading 375 Committee, I haven't updated in a month or two on this group. We really spent the last couple of months solidifying our plans for our town's anniversary celebration this coming spring. And it's really come into focus what it's gonna look like. So I wanted to take, with the Chair's permission, a couple of minutes to go through the plan. And um, so here it is. In 2019, our town turns 375 years old. Uh, 25 years ago, when our town turned 350 years old, which predates my time in Reading, there was apparently a huge town-wide celebration. And so some of the same people got together last year and said we should do it again. 375, every 25 years, we should just celebrate our community. So this group formed last year, I've been a part of it on behalf of the school committee, 
to start brainstorming and working on a town-wide celebration. And I'm happy tonight to report on what that's gonna look like. So it's gonna be a two-week celebration from May 31st to June 15th. And on a cold night like tonight, just imagine how nice it's gonna be in Reading <laughs> the first two weeks of June. It's gonna be delightful and a lot of the activities are outside. It's gonna kick off on May 31st with an opening ceremony on Reading Common. Um, from the, for the full two week period, there's gonna be a program called If This House Could Talk. And if you're at all interested in this, you can go to the website, I'll give you the information in a minute. You, anyone can participate. Um, individual residents are gonna put signs in front of their home, they'll all be identical, so as you walk around town, you'll see that, oh, this, town, this house is participating. And there might be historical information about the house, architectural information about the house, or even just a famous, you know, person from history in Reading lived in this house 100 years ago. So it's really gonna be a neat way for all of us to see the history in our own neighborhoods. So that's gonna be a great program. And like I said, the signs will be out for the two week period. So you can go out at any point during the two weeks, walk around any neighborhood and you're gonna see these signs. Um, on Saturday, June 1st, there's gonna be an anniversary concert right here at the Reading Performing Arts Center. It will feature the Reading Community Singers and the Reading Symphony Orchestra, which um, for those of us with um, children who are younger, it's an amazing opportunity to expose your kids to symphony music at a very low cost to no cost um, right here in town. Oh, thank you. Um, so, so the anniversary concert's gonna be amazing. Also for the two week period, just like this house can talk is gonna be happening, there's a different event happening for the full two weeks called Paint the Town. The kickoff will be Wednesday, June 5th, and for the two-week period, as you walk around Reading to various locations, there's going to be art celebrating the history of Reading created by local artists. So um, there's a lot of adult talent in Reading, a lot of talented artists who live in town who will be creating, they could be modern day um, paintings of Reading, but they could be of historic Reading. And what I'm especially delighted about is the, the art show, Paint the Town art show for the two-week period is open to students grade six and up. So it's also an opportunity for our student artists to present their art in a very public and professional way. So it's, that's just gonna be amazing. But there's more. <laughs> On Saturday, June 8th, for the first time ever, or in anyone's memories, so I think ever, we are gonna be creating Porch Fest. This is, an, yes, this is an event that has actually happened in neighboring communities like Arlington and I think Medford. And uh, yeah, like in other communities, they do this. We've never done it in Reading, and we thought 375 anniversary, this is the time to do it. So for this afternoon, this Saturday afternoon, June 8th, um, any resident in town that has a front lawn or a porch can volunteer to host a band or a group of singers or any musical, it's pretty broad, anything musical. And for the rest of us, we can just walk around town and hear free music, all different all different kinds. There will obviously be a published map, so if you want to see particular kinds of music, you can make it a point to be somewhere, or you can just meander around town and just have this incredible music experience. So we're really excited about that. Um, as many of you know, the <coughs> Reading Rotary every year hosts the Taste of Metro North, which is a super fun event in the field house where many, many, many local restaurants come and you pay one fee, which supports the Rotary, which does great work in the community, but you get to go around and try all this great food from all the different restaurants locally, they have agreed to move the event to this two week period. So as part of running 375 on Wednesday, June 12th, I believe, you can go to Taste of Metro North and have this sort of culinary experience. And then it ends, sadly, after two weeks of fun on Saturday, June 15th with Reading Day. That's the Lions Club Friends and Family event, which always happens in the Birch Meadow area. Um, the Reading Recreation Department and YMCA are talking about hosting some athletic and, and fun activities for younger people. There will be an outdoor concert and it will all end with fireworks. Um, so I just really wanna share the exciting, it is worth marking on your calendar that from May 31st to June 15th, there is gonna be so much fun stuff happening in Reading and definitely worth kind of noting it. It's all at a website called reading375.com. That is where you wanna go. If you wanna know how do I enter the art show, how do I find out where the Porch Fest bands are playing? Like that's where it's all gonna be. So definitely go to writing375.com and it will be updated over the next few months as we get more and more details about what's happening. Final note about Reading 375. Um, it's being funded by grants and private donations. So um, we're doing fundraisers. And the next one happens to be Friday, March 8th 
It is trivia night at RCTV Studios, 7 p.m. I go to them all. They're so much fun. If you're at all into trivia, hanging out with your neighbors, it's a great time. So really strongly recommend folks get out to trivia night for a fun night out and to support a great cause. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Sporowski, for representing the school committee on that. Well, it's really been my pleasure. It really has been. It's a lot of work. So thank you. Ms. Robinson, any report? Dr. Doxer? <coughs> Mr. Worthy? Um, I have one report for us. So um, at our meeting on the 17th, um, we took a vote as a committee to inform the select board of the vacancy left by uh, Dr. Vandenacker on January 22nd. Oh, thank you. <laughs> On January 22nd, they, um, I informed the board in writing and in person, the select board. The select board uh, decided to move forward with the um, appointment process. Uh, so that, that process, there's guidelines about when that has to be advertised. That's um, under the select board's control. They're working on that. But I need to ask committee members about um, a joint meeting on February 13th at 6 p.m. So if I can ask everybody to just get back to me by like noontime tomorrow so I can get back in touch with Bob Lelisher, um, Dr. Doherty and Bob and I are trying to work out the schedule. Um, can you repeat that date, sorry. Yeah, uh, February 13th, I believe that's a Wednesday. Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. And it will likely be here though we haven't decided that. In addition to that right now there are two candidates who have um, gone to the town clerk and grabbed the papers for the appointment and it's a um, application process it's sort of rigorous um, public interview process if someone um, does complete that process we I think we would know that by February 7th or 8th and then we would conduct this meeting and the person would be it would be on the school committee for one meeting the March 28th meeting and then the election is April 2nd. April 2nd, yeah. Election is April 2nd. And um, we'll have, um, we have a number of, there's a number of vacancies for the board, the two-year seat and two three-year positions, which Mr. Robinson had announced. Can I just ask a quick question yeah. about that? Your, the availability you want, it's just the one agenda item. You yes. don't anticipate it being a multi-hour. Right, it's okay. just, it's six o'clock. Um, and again, that meeting will occur if there are applicants that turn the package in. So I will hear back from the select board or Dr. Darty and I will hear back from probably Bob Lillishar. So I need to just make sure that um, people can attend that meeting. So I know that's an additional meeting. We have, um, we have finance committee on the 27th. Um, I just wanna make sure that. So our next meeting is February 7th and yes, February 7th, and then we have Finance Committee uh, to present our budget on the 27th. Eric, are you good? Are you, okay. Uh, okay. February 7th, is that next 20, February, 7th? February 7th is our next meeting. February 27th is when we present to FinCom. And then our next, I know we don't usually do the calendar right now, but then our next meeting after that is March 28th. And we will get, I'll get, we'll get an update on the calendar. There's actually a, a, um, calendar uh, items, not calendar, agenda, tentative agenda items that I'll get out to the board a new calendar. Um, I think that's it. I don't think we have any other reports. So uh, the agenda items tonight, we're actually gonna do the, um, we need to really shift and do the kindergarten update first and then we're gonna go into the um, continued FY20 budget discussion. <clears throat> so um, I uh, turn it over to Dr. Darty right now. Thank you. So in your packet, which we updated today, because um, we were getting some last minute information at the end of last week, uh, is a memo regarding the kindergarten assignments for next year. The letters mm -hmm. are going out this week uh, to, um, to all the kindergarten families. Um, so what you see there is the elementary enrollment chart, so I'm gonna speak a little bit to that and then talk a little bit about the kindergarten piece. So first, the, the elementary enrollment chart, focusing mostly on grades one through five uh, first, and then, and then I wanna handle the kindergarten piece separately. 
So in grades one through five, you can see that um, with the exception of one grade um, at Birch Meadow Elementary School, um, this is projected for next year where, and again, projection, it's only, Feb, it's only January right now and a lot of things we know can happen, particularly in grade one and K, usually is when we see any bumps in enrollment. But what we see right now is the school committee guidelines of K to 2, uh, 18 to 22, and 3 to 5 in the, the mid-20s is, is, you know, being followed. The, the only exception is Birch Meadow grade 1. And the, the biggest reason for that is we do not have any available classroom space at Birch Meadow. Um, these are the students, if you recall from last year, that are currently at Killam. Mm -hmm. The half-day students are at Killam. So they'll be coming back to their, uh, to Birch Meadow for uh, next year in grade one, uh, which is something that we, that I did announce at an earlier school committee meeting. Um, if we did have additional classroom space, we would have recommended, obviously, an additional teacher for grade one at Birch Meadow, but we are unable to do that uh, because we do not have any more classroom space there. So you could see grades one through five that for the most part we're, we're in pretty good shape when it comes to, to class sizes projected for next year. Thanks. So I don't know if there's any questions on that first. And Mr. Robinson. Just uh, trying to remember, so if the, can those, uh, one of any of those Birch Meadow grade one parents request to go to another school? We did won't... offer already them the opportunity to stay at Killam, and they've all requested, I think all of them request to come back, right, Linda? Yes. Okay. I'm going to move on to kindergarten now. Yes. So the memo that you have in front of you um, outlines the process that we used um, for the assumptions as we were putting together the kindergarten assignments for next year. So as we discussed last year at this time, we really are driven by some factors. One is, is that we are in a unique situation as a community because we have two different types of programs. We have both half day and full day. So that, that, that leads to other challenges as we're trying to figure out how to place um, students in the different areas. And obviously, we want to take a look and make sure that we're doing everything we can to uh, follow the class size guidelines. Um, the other piece right now that is an assumption that we're making, and I've had several conversations with Kelly Boswick, the RISE preschool director, is that we are making some assumptions of students that may be um, going to a program placement outside of their neighborhood school. So we are assuming they are going to go to, their, to the outside placement in another school in Reading um, as per their IEP, but a lot of the IEP meetings will not occur till later on uh, this spring. So in conversations that I've had with Kelly, she does feel that um, for the most part those students will be going to those schools, um, to those programs in, in district. But, um, and in addition, we do have some kindergarten siblings of those students. We're assuming that those students will be going along with them. Uh, so if there's twins or triplets or something like that, um, that they will be accompanying their um, brother or sister uh, to the program assignment. So that's an assumption that we are currently making. Um, the other pieces that we're assuming is that the school committee approves the 1.2 FTE increase for elementary classroom teachers in the budget. Um, those would be assigned to Killam and Wood End. Um, and if those uh, were not approved, then we would have grade one Wood End class sizes at, actually that's higher than 26. Um, it would be 27, and the average class size in kindergarten at Killam would be 25, 26. Um, which is why we did recommend those, those additional classrooms. Um, we also are assigning staff within uh, the 
um, configuration. So one of the things that I know Mr. Wavin asked last time is, do we take a look at the staffing for regular day? And um, that is all part of the same meetings that we are having with principals. And one of the things that we are looking at when we do that is we're looking at enrollment and class sizes throughout the elementary. And so we have made some adjustments. The one adjustment that we've made is we've moved for next year a grade four uh, position uh, at Joshua Eaton to grade one at Joshua Eaton to a company adding an additional class in grade one, whereas in grade four, uh, we reduced a class and that would keep us within the class size guidelines that the school committee has, um, has offered. So um, those are things that we've also looked at internally and those are assumptions that we've made as well. So using all of those assumptions, um, what we have done is, and you can see on the chart uh, on the back page of the memo, page two of the memo, uh, we currently have 36 half-day students uh, in the district. Um, and you can see by the chart how they've been assigned um, by their neighborhood school area. So we have two at Barrows, eight at Birch Meadow, nine at Eaton, 12 at Killam, and five at Wood End. We do anticipate that that number's gonna go up. Um, Usually the half-day numbers are the numbers that um, will increase from this point on because all of the full day, uh, the registration period for full day is ended. It was in December. Um, and so now any student uh, that wants full day would be on a waiting list. And we do have students on a waiting list. You also see that we do include there um, the half-day students that um, have siblings within that school, the number of full day students, um, and full-day students with siblings. We also have listed below the available classrooms for each school for kindergarten. So we're, what we're going to be doing is, unfortunately, um, what we have right now is a situation where we do not have enough classroom space in the district to create, throughout the district, separate full-day and half-day classrooms um, like we have this year. The reason why we had them available this year is we had two years in a row um, of lower kindergarten enrollment. We have this year a larger kindergarten enrollment, which if you look at the enrollment chart next year, because we do have some first grade students coming back from private, um, we're gonna be probably up to 339 next year for grade one at kindergarten, uh, for first grade, which is, as you can see right now, is a, the highest number in our elementary. Um, our kindergarten number for, this, for next year is projected to be 318, which is also a high number. Um, and again, that's one of the higher numbers. And you can see the next year's grade two and three, you see 297, 278. That's the reason why we had available classroom space last, uh, this current year. Um, so now we're starting to go back up again um, with, with enrollment in the primary grades. So unfortunately, because of that, we do not have the ability to go more the traditional route of full day and half day separated. So we are gonna have to take a look at going integrated at Barrows, Birch Meadow, um, Eaton and Wood End, and we will be doing the traditional at, at Killam where we will have um, three full day sessions and one half day session. Um, we did look at possibly moving some of the Birch Meadow students to kill them, the half-day students. But in talking to Principal uh, Hendricks, uh, we felt that at this point, since that would be the only school that would be relocating that, and um, you know, we discussed the, that it would be a little bit higher class size, but she felt it would be better to keep the students um, at Birch Meadow for next year. Most, some, a lot of those students also live outside the two mile and we would have to provide busing. John, uh, hold on. Yeah, Mr. Robinson. Oh, John, can yep. I jump in? Yeah, yeah. Uh, have we, and I know you've probably gone through a thousand different scenarios, but. I'll just say it and then they do mine. And maybe you just answered that question when you mentioned Mrs. Hendricks, but what about, uh, combining uh, like Killam and Wood End and then Eaton, Birch Meadow and Barrows so you've got two half-day classes. So the only place we have space to do that is at Killam. OK. 
yeah. which means we would have to bus pretty much everyone else to Killam next year, which is a cost that we do not have in the budget. Yeah. I just want to, um, just a little bit of a point of order, indicate that, um, you know, as we came into the meeting, we, I did swap the order of the agenda um, as we made that change later today. So if there are people who arrive later for questions on this, we'll figure out a way to, go, uh, you know, have them, their questions answered. Um, uh, on the kindergarten, let me just I, If sure. I can, there was just one other thing just I want to say. So then, yep. earlier in the year, uh, I can't remember if it was in the fall meeting or the spring meeting that we were talking about kindergarten, we, we listed, you know, priority areas as we were, as to guide the superintendent in these decisions. You know, and unfortunately next year, the, the only one we're going to be able to do is to give everyone full-day kindergarten that wants it. Mm-hmm. Right, and then we've got the um, separate or traditional classroom at Killam. Right. So I think it just, um, you know, the, I, your memo highlights this, and I think it's something that we've been talking about. And obviously, we have a um, elementary space planning and enrollment study that we made a decision to begin funding um, whenever we made that decision earlier this fall. I think this certainly highlights that, and if I remember correctly, I see that you know that number right now. First grade is three thirty nine. I think I remember that was like a three eleven or something. No, it was higher. It, what higher? what we always have is a bump up in first grade, first grade. Um, mm -hmm. and that's what's reflected. I'm not sure the exact number mm -hmm. that are coming from private kindergarten, but it's eight to ten kids. Uh, I think, yeah. yeah. So, so that that does. So, it was a large class to begin with. Right. So while, um, you know, the integrated we model is maybe p p potentially not as ideal as we would want um, as the, if we could have the traditional model, it does allow um, students, the half-day students to stay in their home schools. I know that um, Mr. Boyden, that was, you know, so there was a lot of discussion on that last year. Um, and I think the space issue is something that obviously we're going to need to address if we have another year of um, incoming kindergarten class similar to this year, um, you know, we, we're, we're pushing against the limits of so, the building. So to that end, I am, and I put this in the memo, mm -hmm. um, I am concerned about the 2021 yeah. school year at Birch Meadow, particularly, for the following reasons. One is you've already, you already see um, we've got higher class sizes in K and 1 at Birch Meadow. Um, in addition, in the FY20 budget, we are hiring an additional special education program teacher at Birch Meadow because we are seeing an increased number of students um, for the special education programs. We are going to probably need space for that program in 2021. Mm -hmm. So we, we do have a space issue at Birch Meadow in the 2021 school year. Mm -hmm. Ms. Robinson. So just another question, because you, you put it out there, the, the busing, what, what are we talking about in terms of how much is that? What do you think, Gail, do you have an idea of what busing would cost if we... If we bust all of them? If we bust to kill them? You're talking $50,000. Right, to add a bus. Yeah, to add a bus. To add a bus. $50,000. Okay. Well, and we'd be taking kids out of the neighborhood school. And the bus would have to go all over town. It isn't like yeah, it's Barrows. That's fine. It's, I just yeah. want to know the, the answers of those yeah. questions. Yeah, it'd be a long bus ride. Ms. Brosky, did you have another question? Um, I just wanted to um, point out and sort of validating what Dr. Doherty said. I think you already said this, but you're really right about the Birch Meadow thing because the Birch Meadow problem, because that kindergarten class, if in fact we always consistently see it, consistently see a bump up into first grade those kindergarten numbers are already too high. And if what you're saying is we can count on a handful more kids coming in in first yep. grade and there isn't a classroom to split into, I just want to, you're absolutely right. There's a real problem for the next school year. I just, that's true. Right, for not, not these, this is 1920 projections, but for the 2021 as we bring the next class. It's gonna get worse. So I think it, there'll be a lot more discussions. It's gonna be something that we're gonna probably need to begin to address. Um, maybe in the spring and have some more discussions on. 
Yeah, because they're the you know the elementary um, space planning is not going to be far enough along. I mean that solution is going to take a long time, yeah. and it would seem to we may be needing to talk about an interim action. Dr. Doxer. Um, I'm, I'm really concerned about these numbers, and I remember back when we, sorry, I remember back when we were deliberating over the modulars, and when Dr. Doherty predicted that this was going to happen, um, and wondering, you know, when the shoe was going to fall, and it looks like that shoe is falling. And so what I'm wondering is what kinds of timing is spring soon enough to start talking about finding the space if that's what we need to do, if we're going to need to go to back to that discussion of other modulars or um, other options? Is the spring soon enough to start talking about that or do we need to be working with our facilities committee and town building committee sooner? And I'm not talking about taking the place of the building committee of the um, study that's going to go on, but in order to deal with these, and they're not numbers, they're children coming into Birch, that are already at Birch Meadow so, and in our kindergartens. Right, we're, we're talking about the 2021 school year. No, I realize that, so, but I just didn't uh, realize we, time. We would be, yeah, we've had, we, when we went through the process the last time, um, it was April Town Meeting that approved <laughs> The modular classrooms for the following fall. Okay, so that was a six month. And I'm just using that as an months. example. I'm not suggesting that that's a direction. I'm just saying that's. And and I wasn't either, except that we knew we were warned that this was coming, the the large numbers of students. So, so that's an eight month lead time, not a year and a half lead time. Right. No, no. It, it's we've got. We have the. It was the spring that spring. So we have time. Yes. Have time. Yes. That's just clarifying. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, right. Mr. Robinson. So, uh, <laughs> you know, obviously we talked about this a lot last year, and the, <laughs> you know, the educational value of integrated versus traditional, and. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying anything that wasn't said in this room that the the integrated was less optimal. We talked about that. Uh, so, what are, what are we going to do to? Are we going to be able to look take a look at that and how can we make that better than it was the last time we did integrated? Is there something we can do? Uh, I don't know. Uh, look at the look at how we, how we did things in the past and how we can improve them or I, 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 I don't know if there's any you know there may not be a good answer for that but I think it's at least uh, we got to look into it we, we certainly will right yes I mean, we certainly will yeah we are the principals elementary principals uh, and my department are already starting to talk about schedules so we'll do the best we have with what we with what we've got Chuck I'm you know, it's not optimal. You have to fit all your specialists in. You have you have a lot to fit in a very, very quick morning. Um, but we'll do the best we can. A lot of districts have to do this as well, and we'll talk to other districts and see if they have any little tricks that we can borrow, but we'll do our best. Our number one focus is to do what's developmentally appropriate. So that means a combination of really looking at academics and making sure that we've got lots of breaks and movement breaks too. So um, the good news is that uh, the entire administrative team is on board with kindergarten being developmentally appropriate and yet get them ready for first grade. So they're in good hands. We'll do the best we can. Thank you. Uh, um, I know uh, Mr. Corum uh, yes. first, then we'll. <clears throat> Jeffrey Corum, uh, Ridge Road. I guess. I mean, it's been a while since my kids were at Birch Meadow, but what I remember from Birch Meadow was there were two half-day classes and one full-day kindergarten, so that only used two classrooms. And now we're using three classrooms because of the full day. And I guess, and now we're seeing the space problems and we're trying to figure out, you know, we're doing the, the integrated classroom, which isn't what we like. And, that, and if you switched one of the kindergartens, so you only had two classrooms instead of three, if you did the, the two half-day, one full-day, you could get three kindergarten classes and two classrooms and you'd have the extra space 
for a bubble class in, in first grade. So I guess my question is, and I guess it was discussions a little while ago about how we set the numbers for how many full day kindergarten slots we have available and why we didn't look at, at that and say, hey, we need to reduce the number of full day kindergarten spots available so we can have two half day classes. And I understand there are certainly parents who want that full day option, but are we sticking people in, in funny places because we didn't really want to do integrated and we don't really want to have all of these kids in the first grade 24 per classroom because we made this other decision to increase the number of full day slots available. I think the committee had talked about basically trying to meet the needs of the community on full day and um, you know that again that I believe this is slightly higher percentage than last it's, yeah, year. Yeah, I think well, I, I didn't do, do the latest calculation. We were at 90%. I'm not sure if that's changed or not. So I think that that, that was, you know, one of the priorities. Um, I think at, at this point with the registrations, that, that will be something that we'll have to consider capping. We haven't had to cap or chosen well, to we, cap the full we've day. not done a lottery. Right. Which is its own years. difficult process. Mm -hmm. And families do need full day kindergarten. It's very evident in this community. Ms. Sporowski? Yeah. And they, they, yeah, they want it. They want it. Um, that was a really good point. So I thank you, Mr. Quorum. That was a really good point on part of this discussion. I found myself thinking as you spoke about what Dr. Doherty said, which is, yep, that's an option. It's another lousy option, right? It's a bad option. It means telling parents in this community, um, this used to be a town where if you wanted full day kindergarten, it was available. And you're talking about moving to a path of it might be available, we don't know, and there'll be a lottery, and some kids will get it, and some kids won't. And that's very difficult for families to plan around, right? Like, I need to know what my kid's schedule looks like next year. So that, as Dr. Dory said, presents a lot of other problems. But I hear Dr. Um, Mr. Robinson's point, too. I think integrated is not ideal. It's not. Um, and I think we heard loud and clear from parents last year that what we did last year, sending kids to dedicated programs, which might be the educational ideal, was very not ideal for families. So what I'm hearing and what I think about this problem is what we have every single year is a less than optimal solution. Um, and so what that hits me in the face with is there is one optimal solution, I think. This is one of the only towns in Massachusetts that doesn't have publicly funded full day kindergarten, and I'm fully aware that that costs a million dollars a year, and I, I don't know. That's the problem, and that actually, in my mind, is the solution. That's the only solution that's going to stop this conversation happening every spring. So, I just, I, no, I think um, no. You're absolutely right. Right. You're absolutely right about that. It definitely that's. Right. You're right. And I think it's a good idea to think about them together. I absolutely think it's a good mm -hmm. idea to think mm -hmm. about them together. There were some other questions. Um, Mrs. Geffen. Uh, Aaron Gaffin, Hemlock Road. I don't really have a question so much as a commentary. Um, I have a, um, three kids currently in the schools. I have a fourth grader who, when in the integrated kindergarten, was in a class size of 25. Um, I have a kindergartner now who is fortunate to be in dedicated full day classroom. Um, I'm just astounded that this is where we are. After all of the drama that went down last year with families being displaced from their neighborhood schools and um, the communication pieces around that, I felt like the overarching message was that traditional full day was what was best for kids. And now we're saying we can't do what's best for kids. So I would like to see a closer look on this. And I'm hoping that this is not a decision that has to be made tonight. Um, and I don't know if letters the letters are going out. Went and actually, in the mail. <laughs> I, let me just. Let but me just. I just want to finish. When, you know, when my oldest started um, at Josh Wheaton, music was in the cafeteria, and I know that's another unpopular choice, but I still think at the end of the day, I don't know how you look at incoming kindergarten parents and now say, oh, we made this huge argument that traditional full day is what's best for kids. You got a letter last year from 
I think every kindergarten teacher in the district saying, we want to teach traditional full day. We mm -hmm. do not like the integrated model. It's not what is best for kids. And now we're going back and saying that that's what we have to do. So I, I don't know what the solution is. I have been following things for years. I understand the space issue, but I would hope that we can look outside the box and focus on what's best for the kids in the classroom and figure out a way to make that happen. So I, I just want to let you know, Mrs. Gavin, that over the last two months, I have actually worked very closely with Dr. Darty. We've looked at, and I'm the first one to have pushed back and said, we can't, we really need to find a way to do the traditional model. And we cannot do that without space. Now, we, there was some, do we, do we have space at the high school? We looked at that. Uh, Principal Boynton provided some input. Could there be, you know, some space here? And I think, you know, that perhaps um, that's part of the solution for the, as we're talking about for 2021. Do we, do we, do we need modulars at the Birch Meadow site or do we look at some space here and do we put, you know, some programs here? I think long term, as Ms. Borowski talked about, we need to look at that overall space and say, how do we structure our district and how are we going to, you know, how are we going to address this? If we're going to have this model that is both a full day tuition and, and half day publicly provided program, we're going to need to be able to be, I think, more agile about how you construct that. And trying to do that across five buildings is quite challenging. So I just, over the last two months, uh, I know I attended the first uh, meeting that, I don't remember when that was, Dr. Dardy, November? That was in November, November. early November. November with the kindergarten parents. And there's been a, a lot of dialogue with the principals. So agreed, this isn't ideal. And I know that um, Mr. Robertson, for one, um, is we've shared our, um, you know, we, we feel like we fought hard to, to for that and to, to stand up for that um, and say that that was really important and that's, you know, we understand that people were moving students out of their neighborhood school so that they could be in this classroom. And if we could do that in this scenario, potentially we would have. Um, if, you know, if there was another classroom at Birch Meadow, then potentially that would have been a second site this year and we would have been under, you know, there would have been a different dialogue. But I think that this is, these, this is, these letters are, you know, going out. This isn't a committee, it's not actually a committee decision um, on this. But. Yeah, it's, if I can add to this, and we're seeing it in grade one this year at Birch Meadow. We can postpone the problem for a year, and Jeffrey, I know what you were saying about, you know, shifting full day, half day. In grade one, they come back. So they may all leave and go to private kindergarten if they don't get full day, they all come back. You still have the space class size issue in grade one. So the problem is we, and, and we, we are seeing a similar problem in Rice Preschool. So that's a whole nother piece of this that the, the planning study is gonna have to look at. We have a space problem in the school district and we have had for years. And we got a little bit of a reprieve a few years ago when we got six modular classrooms. But we, we can't keep doing it this way. I, I do think that incoming kindergarten parents are going to see this as another blind side. I, they've been made very aware of this yep. in letters and in presentations. And, and I've got the letters to show it. Okay. <laughs> this is, we try to keep the meeting structured so you can raise your hand and we'll get everyone a turn. So. That was it. Thank I you. To speak. If I can comment on that, because I have been sharing with the committee all the correspondence that's been going to kindergarten parents this year and the presentation that we made in November. Right. We made it very clear that it could be an integrated program. People could be relocated to another school, that a lot of it had to do with classroom space and staffing availability. And we've been saying that loud and clear. Right, and parents were also asked, I believe, to provide sort of, this is my um, first choice, this is what I would like so for my student first choice, but if they were also asked or invited to express that, um, but staying in my neighborhood school is important to me, right. and so I would switch programs to stay in my neighborhood school. So parents were asked to provide that input in November and through the letters. So. Um, 
Please. Did you have another comment? Yep, you need to come up to the mic. And just, you need to state your name and address. I've done this before, so I apologize for not knowing any of the rules. <laughs> um, I'm Eileen Pruitt. I live on Bethune Ave. Um, Can you go a little closer to the mics? Thank you. Eileen Pruitt, Bethune Ave, right off of Forest Street. And I have a second grade kindergartner who was in an integrated classroom uh, for kindergarten. I'm sorry, second grader who was in an integrated kindergarten. And I have an incoming son next year who's going to be in kindergarten at Birch. Um, so a couple of things kind of kill me here. Um, we sat in a room last April and listened to Dr. Doherty and a bunch of the principals all speak pretty emotionally about how that didn't work and that wasn't the best thing for our kids. And I echo Aaron here. We all walked out of that room and there may not have been the 300 families, but that room was jammed. And we all walked out of that room and the common conversation we all had was, thank God we finally got rid of that. And so to come back and say this is a well communicated plan that we're going back to integrated, which is very clearly what you guys said, not ideal for our children, is a slap in the face. And I have not gotten one piece of mail that said we were going to go back there. We might have had a survey. I don't, maybe I missed it, or maybe you talked about it in school committee meetings that I cannot always attend. I just ripped myself out of the house because I heard the meeting got, this agenda item got moved up, right? So my kids are in the tub, my mom came over, <laughs> you know, like, it's just not a well communicated plan. And it's pretty emotional to me because my son will not thrive in this environment like most children will not. And so if you ask me, do I want to send my kid to Wood End for kindergarten? Yes, that is a pain. I am a working mother. That is not ideal in my household, but it is ideal for my child, so I'll do that. So if you ask the 300 families, most of which we have probably 20 families that have kindergartners going in that I know, none of them know this is coming. Everyone thinks this is a um, single classroom with integrated, with half days and full days. So if you could ask the 300 families, the letter, right? The letter, I actually proofed, I, I can say that I personally um, saw the letters before they went out in November. I, if there's, if the letters that, um, Invited people to the kindergarten. Was it the open house? What was it? The meeting I went called? to all of that. I've gone to every November. open house. The, the room was packed. I shared it with the committee and I mean, we mailed it out packed. to every kindergarten parent. We said it explicitly at the November meeting because one of the things we heard loud and clear last year is that people weren't aware that they, their child could get moved. So we made it very clear that every option was on the table, including integrated, including moving. So you may have perceived it as being clear. I can tell you lots of kindergarten parents have no idea this is coming. Okay, I, and to I, get an email tomorrow or whatever we're going to well, get I, is going to be shocking. I just say I attended, because of this issue last year, I personally, I attended that meeting at Killam, and every one of the principals who got up also spoke about that, and the letter was clear. This is by far. I was in that meeting. It's part, were you at that meeting? I, I was in the kindergarten meeting with the million families. At Killam. So yeah. this, was, this was discussed at the meeting. It was part of the presentations. It so was in the letter. The takeaway from that meeting, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the takeaway from that meeting, we all walked out saying the same thing, was they finally admitted the integrated classroom was not acceptable for our families. That, it, this, in the school committee meetings last year, okay, uh, well, at the end, certainly <laughs> we, were, we were, because we feel like educationally that's the best. If we could do that and move students, we would. Now, I would say that, um, and I don't know, but Dr. Darty, I mean, there is a half day uh, kindergarten at Killam with 12, 12 students in it. Yeah. So uh, I, that may present an option if families right. optionally wanted to do that, but I don't, I, I don't know how. So I'm, I just I'm were speaking out of turn here, but I, I, I hear what you're saying, and we, it was explicit that I participated because of this communication. We'll, we'll, I can look at the letters. I can just tell you that we yeah. worded and reworded the letters. And, I, and was at that meeting to make sure that people understood that we, because we knew in November that we weren't sure where we are because we have this space issue because the last kindergarten was very large. So that's where you lose me because you were very explicit in the last meeting and we all talked about it, how grateful we were that Reading was supporting our kids. Which last meeting? I'm the talking about- The kindergarten meeting, I don't know. Which one in November with the, at the kindergarten meeting uh, where the yeah, principals all I think it was November. Were, Okay, so I need to just say that we, we I, I hear you, 
Okay, um, so all I'm gonna do is respectfully ask that this isn't a done deal and you listen to the 300 families before you make a decision and just send an email. This is not up for school committee vote. And, it, and I think as Ms. Borowski highlighted, this, is a, this issue is something that's gonna continue to come up for us if we have, we need the space and we need the budget for teachers in order to, to be able to meet the needs of both communities. And it's just not feasible to say that you can have, you, we cannot have a half day classroom right for two students. So we, are, we will be in that position of having to consolidate. I agree with you. Um, and I saw the numbers and I think there are options that at least are warrant a discussion. That's all I'm asking. So I, I believe, Dr. Darty, if there was, if there were students that wanted to switch to the half day at Killam, they could, they could, Absolutely. they could elect to do that. Um, but, but if you're going to offer half day for all the kids, because the people who benefit are the 10% of the kids who get the integrated, right? Because their half day kids are going to get their full three hours. It's the rest of the 90% of the kindergartners who are going to be jammed for the three hours and then have reinforcement and recess. And that's what we're paying our $4,500 for, right? So I guess if, if all of the students who, were in, who have um, selected half day wanted half day, we, we would, we'd have to get additional if funding if that's only half an FTE. But there, there would be space, I believe, at Killam to run a morning and afternoon session and accommodate those students. We, we have budgeted a teacher for, both, for two sessions at Killam for half day. Right. Yes. So all 36 students could be accommodated at Killam in a morning and afternoon session. So there's, there's no, there's no that, that could happen. But again, those, each of those parents has to make a decision, would have to be making a decision that, that they want that over their neighborhood school. So, so I just, again, respectfully ask, so those 36 kids get to make a decision, but the other 90% of the kids get no decision. The, the full day, because the full day, is, we can't move the full days. This is what we have for capacity, this is right? What, I agree, I'm saying, but you're gonna ask the 36 kids if they'll go to kill them, no, but you won't they, ask the other 90% if they want integrated. We're not asking them to go to kill them. We're saying this, this model says, you will stay at the neighborhood school. It would be the integrated model. We recognize that that is not ideal, and hopefully by next year we will have a, a different solution with regard to some interim space so that where we can offer, again, traditional models at maybe two schools or two locations. But this, this year, um, that's going to be the, the you know, that's, this is where we are. And I, I do really feel like it was communicated in November. We were e explicit, and I know, to review the communication and the presentation. I very but well could have missed an email. I think I took the meeting. I think the for. letters were mailed. Were so paper this, mailed? This, ma this letter went out in October of 2018. It was the registration packet letter that went to all kindergarten families. So we filled that out, right? Because we had to turn and it in. And in that letter, Paragraph. It is important to note that based on kindergarten enrollment for each program in classroom space availability, it is possible that half day kindergarten classes may. The one before that. Oh, sorry. I am oh, positive, okay. Dr. Doherty, that it oh, may be. Our half day program may be traditional or consist of an integrated model with full and half day students mixed in each class based on available space and enrollment. I am positive that that line was buried in the 20 page document we received, but walking out of the other meeting where we looked you in the eye and you said the things you said and all of the principals supported it, I thought that was legalese. Uh, which, can, if I can ask, which meeting are we talking about? I will about? go back and look at my calendar. Are we talking about the November meeting this fall or are we talking about a school committee meeting? No, it was the November kindergarten meeting. We made it very clear and we have the slides also that we did yeah. not, we did not so know at that point what was gonna you happen. You didn't know, but you acknowledged that it was not ideal and you were moving away from it if possible. Absolutely, but I don't have the classroom space, I can't. So I think That's there's the options line. we could we could look at though before you say that. Is we, that I, mean, I, I is have it? been looking at it for a couple months now. That's what I'm trying to say. With all of the principals <laughs> with all of the principals and but did you ask any of us? Or I'm not you, and you don't make, well yeah you do have to ask us. We're the parents of the children that we pay taxes to go to school. At. So I think it would have been maybe we would all vote to have our kids go to a, a, a classroom that isn't integrated. And I don't have to take up all this time, but I just wish you would listen to the parents of the kids you're affecting before you make your decisions. I, I, 
Thank you. Thank I'd you. like to just, I know Dr. Okay. Doxer would like to make a comment and then there was someone here. else in the audience. <laughs> it's, it's okay. okay. I was just gonna what say, that Linda's been so <clears throat> I was just gonna say that I completely understand how the, the spoken message and the written message can get convoluted. I actually, um, I, I took issue with that line being in the letter because I didn't want it to be there because we were definitive on not feeling as though that was the optimal program for our kids. But the reality of the space constraints meant that we couldn't make a promise that we couldn't keep. And so that line needed to be in there because come the end, when this decision had to be made, it depended on the numbers of students that, that went for the full day and that went for the half day. And so the flexibility had to be built in there. And I completely understand how disappointed you are and where it comes from. And um, I think that Dr. Darty has been hearing a lot of that from a lot of us. Um, and the unfortunate piece is that we don't have the space. I would like to ask, I, I suspect you have considered, um, Ms. Gaffin brought in the question of art and music in separate rooms. I know because I was coming onto the committee when we discussed the, the modulars that we made promises not to deceive ourselves that by using those art and music rooms that we could solve the space problem. And so we had made promises to teachers, to parents, that we wouldn't go back to art on a cart and we wouldn't go back to music on the stage. And so I suspect that that's part of where we're coming from, but Ms. Geffen asked a question about did we consider those spaces and I'm wondering whether they came into the conversation. Yes. Part of the problem is that in some of our schools, Birch Meadow, Barrows in particular, not, our music okay. classrooms are very small. They're not full classrooms. They're not full classrooms. So we would not be able to put a kindergarten. And art on the cart, cart does not work from a curriculum standpoint. You can't, you can't do it. So it's another compromise that all of which is being considered in this, this other compromise. There's some Mr. Robinson. I just wanted to go back to the, the kill them uh, with the two class, you know, if we were able to put the two kindergarten classes there and we talked about the busing aspect of it. I, I think I know the answer, but are we, I mean, what if, uh, I think I heard that parents say that, you know, she'd be willing to get her kid to that school. Do we? We have legally have to provide busing or over two miles. Can we? Yeah. So, okay. And you can't just assume a parent's going to do it because a parent at any point could come back and say the law says you have to bus my child. So. Yeah. So we, in theory, if we we could pay for a, I mean, I don't know if it's 50 or 75, if we did a bus, we, that could solve, we could take care of this with a bus. We, we could. Right, okay. But it, you know, I don't know whether you, if you're driving all over town or not, we'd have to. You would have to, yeah. Because uh, it's, it's essentially four schools you would have to pick. We do not have busing at any of our elementary schools oh, right I now know. except for Killam. So I guess, can I just, can, so I guess more. to the, Ms. Gaffin's point, you know, if we, is that something we can get a little more, uh, a little more solid information on the, the, the cost of a bus and how it would, you know, kind of a, a drop a route as to. No, that's the cost of it. it you, you pay so much a day. So it, it comes out to a little over fifty thousand okay. dollars. I think, I think uh, Ms. Borowski, just a quick point. I think it's it's good to be kind of thinking about these options, but we heard from parents last spring who were irate 
at being told that their child had to leave the neighborhood school and go to a different school. So I think that you would solve one problem. People would be happy we weren't doing integrated, but you are going to have parents very, very angry that, because they were last year, very I, angry. I, I get, can I reply? Yeah. yeah. I, I, under, I agree, but you know, we, you know, and as I said, it's full transfer. We can all go back and look at the yeah. tape. We all said that the You're integrated right. wasn't the right model. Now I'm trying to figure out a way to not go back to that. I hear so. you. I, I, I hear stand you. corrected, $64,800 for a bus. For next year. Right. And I, I just want to reiterate, I agree that we, we said that that was not optimal, and I think that that was at the beginning of this year. I think John, I, John's had his head in his hands on this since since October, at least when we started talking about it, and saying this is this is going to be difficult. There's you know the space constraints, the number of students that want full day, and um, the, you know the the number that want half day. This is a difficult um, position that we're in, and that the solution is not going to be optimal. But I think Mr. Rask made the point. We're just Given the situation that we're in, we're not going to achieve optimal and solutions. I'm not suggesting that Dr. Dari hasn't done. I'm. We're here now. Yeah. We're fine. So we we're trying to come up with other other ideas. That's all. I think the class and the other in terms of what parents would really want to do. Um, you know, there are some of the schools where I, there are two students at Barrows. I I can't imagine that those two may want to leave to go to Kellum. But you know that's um, you know, that would end up like you said it's, it's one decision or the other. But that's bus safe, right, Mr. Boyden? Yeah, so I seem to remember that as a committee we voted on a series of prioritized guidance mm -hmm. priorities. That's true. Can you add those? I think you had those in the slide show that you gave on kindergarten. Is that right? The only priority that we were able to fulfill this year is full day kindergarten. Right, so but it, I think it would be helpful for everybody to know that's that's the guidance we gave the superintendent, at right. Least, right? So we set policy, we don't assign kindergarten classrooms. We can't do that. That's out against the law, right? That's the superintendent's area, right? We don't administer. We set policy, we evaluate the student superintendent, we set budget, that's what we do. So on the policy side, one of the concerns I had last year was was around what I perceived as an abruptness of the change to a model where we had some half-day sites, and but it was with, I believe, a traditional model, not an integrated model. So we had traditional but not integrated, but okay, some people like that, but then we had people leaving their neighborhood schools. They were being assigned, you know, and one of the concerns I raised was now you have parents who have paid their property tax and just want half day but now can't attend the neighborhood school they're paying property tax for without paying $4,500, $5,000. So to me, that, that was an added factor to consider. You know, do you really have to pay $4,500 to go to the school down the street that you bought a house to be next to and pay property tax for? It's a factor. It's not the, not the, not the only thing, but it should be discussed. So what we did as a committee in response to all these considerations was, it was I thought, gave some pretty clear guidance to the superintendent as a just policy matter, but not, not, not deciding how this question should be answered every year. And access to full day, you know, Dr. Darty, you're absolutely right. That's number one on your list, right? And that's and that's what you were able to achieve here. Those who wanted full day have full day, correct? So you've achieved that. The next was class size. We're struggling with that in some places, but it, it's many of the classrooms are under the 22 that we recommend to. Right. But um, the third factor, I believe, was integrated or traditional. Correct. Right. Correct. So we never got there. So we followed the guidance. We. You know, every year is going to present a different enrollment configuration, and so I just think it would be helpful to have that very prominent for, for everyone to understand that you know we the the current guidance the committee has for the superintendent is a flexible one, and it could mean that some years we have half day sites with traditional, and other years we have um, the model that apparently we have next year, which is an integrated model. If you don't like that guidance, I guess the committee is the place to, to change guidance for policy. But that's the policy that the superintendent I, seems to me was following. So I, I would just direct to the guidance and help everyone understand that mm -hmm. as soon as we get the numbers in, we're going to do the best to prioritize the way the school committee's provided guidance. If you don't like that, this is the venue to change uh, policy, but not to reassign children. That's not what we do. Yeah, that's okay. what I think. Right. Yes. Melissa Murphy, I live on Van Norden Road. 
So a couple of questions, and I apologize if this was said, we came in a few minutes late. Um, so just looking at this quick, um, I'm curious of why we can't combine a half day class of e um, Woodend and Birch and then Barrows and Eaton. I don't know if it's space, I don't even know if it was talked about. I wasn't here when you started the conversation. I thought it was gonna start at 8.20, so I apologize. It's space. The only available space we have to do it is Killam. Okay, so there's no classroom, extra classrooms at Woodend? Is that because of rise or because of grades one through five? I'm sorry. Is, that is there no rise? extra classrooms at Woodend because of rise or because of grades one through five? Uh, both. Okay, so. And special education programming. Uh, okay, obviously we keep, but I guess, can we cut back on a rise classroom? No. Why is that a no? Because we are required to educate students with special amount. needs Fine. and we have to have, we have to have by law, mm -hmm a ratio of regular education and special education students. And as that number grows, you have to have more classrooms Okay, to and do then that. what about bringing um, a classroom here to the high school for Wood End and Birch? Where? To the high school. Could you put a no, but kindergarten where? classroom? Okay. I, I don't know, I'm asking. No, we don't have the space. There's no extra classrooms? No. So the other thing that kind of got me a little bit that you said, Dr. Darty, is you're like, art on a cart does not work for a curriculum, but you think an integrated classroom for our kindergarten children is a better curriculum and a better educational model? We would not be able to teach art. I'm more worried about my kid learning educational ABCs, reading in kindergarten than him learning art. I, I think the issue though is the classrooms aren't properly no, sized. It, it, it's At not art in kindergarten, be. it's art in grades one through five. We don't have art in kindergarten. Well, actually, you said they did in the full day classrooms. I no, we do that. not have art in kindergarten. So it's art the only special they don't get in kindergarten? That is correct. Okay. They have music and food. Um, so there, if, I mean, I just have a hard time believing that you, all of you, sat here. You, our kindergarten teachers last year wrote letters saying how awful of model integrated classrooms were for our children. You all agreed, and now you're pretty much slapping us all back in the face and doing this to our children. And we're talking about 90% of the kids are gonna be affected by this. Barrows, I don't even go to Barrows. Uh, my kids are at Wood End. But the fact that there are two kids at Barrows that are making that an integrated classroom is, you talk about being unfair. Last year you felt like, people felt like things were unfair. That is unfair to the rest of those children. You're taking a full day and cramming everything into three hours. And Ms. Kelly, I was curious, you had mentioned that um, other towns do integrated models. Which town? So the model that I'm familiar with, they actually went to full day last year. Winchester. But up until recently, Winchester did a, a full but they integrated, integrated model. They, no, they were, and the kids left at 1230. Yeah, but everyone left at 1230. No. The full day no, kids. the full day kids stayed but only one or two days a week? Three days a week. So it wasn't a full, it wasn't a Monday through well, Friday. Well, that's what they call a full day. That's what they called a full day in, Win in Winchester. Because I have two friends that live in Winchester. Yeah. It was a little different than our model, but there are not towns. I have a lot of friends in a lot of different towns. Most no towns one have has gone to a full day program. 100%. Yeah. But I have, n most people are blown away by this model. Right. It is just not a good academically sound model for our kids. And the fact that you're sitting here, Dr. Doherty, and you're annoyed by the fact that we're asking for you to take, come back and look at this is extremely frustrating. So first of all, I'm not annoyed. You okay, are second of all, that way. I don't agree with the integrated mm -hmm. model, and I said it last year, and I'm, I said mm -hmm. it again this year. I am handcuffed. I do not have any other options. That is the problem. I have been looking at this for two months now. I have been talking to elementary principals. I have been talking to school committee members. We have communicated the concerns. I've been communicating space concerns in this district since 2010. I understand that. I was a so huge supporter I, I of yours am, when you I wanted those modulars. I just, we so, have no option of getting kids to kill them or any other school with um, extra classrooms, I guess you need. We, we don't have any extra classrooms anywhere in this district. That's the problem. Killam is the only place where we have one classroom where we could have two half-day programs, two half-day classes. Okay. That's it. So where are the RISE classrooms all going? Are they coming back to Wood End or are they staying at Killam? They're at Wood End in the high school. Next year. Next year. I, I really, really respectfully ask you to go back and look at this. Oh, and the other thing that I wanted to bring up, and I know, Ms. Webb, you said this, that, you know, it was, I was at the October kindergarten meeting and I sat there 
for the whole meeting and listened very clearly, and at no time did I even get any inkling that there was a <coughs> possibility of going back to integrated classrooms. At zero time, and I sat there the whole meeting. And believe, I have four kids. This is my fourth to go through. So I've been, three years, I've tried to avoid integrated with all of my other kids. And at no time did I walk away thinking it was even a possibility because it was said what a terrible situation it was. So for you to say it was lack of communication, the only lack of communication was the fact that you guys, I guess for me it was that you guys said how awful that model was and now you're turning around and putting it right back in my lap again. And it's, it's a terrible situation and I really respect and asking you to go back and think about it before. And you are gonna have a million parents calling you and in your office because I can tell you, no one hey, knows can, this is we coming. We don't really wanna go there. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Alicia Williams, Marla Lane. I was one of those parents that was in that room last year and uh, the roller coaster of emotions that we were put on was pretty Can I just, tough. Last year, I want to make sure we're not talking, are we talking about the meeting in November at Kellum? No, October? the meeting okay. that was in the downstairs conference room. Okay, at the, for yes. kindergarten assignment what last year. What month was that? It was a blur, January? Late, a little later, I think. Yeah. It was February. It's it's really hard to, to hear this going on again. We Those parents fought really hard to sort of fix the process, and I was really hopeful that we would see the process change and I'm, I'm frustrated to see the process hasn't changed. I feel like we need as a town to come up with a plan, stick to the plan. Parents stand on the playground and they say, what are you doing next year for kindergarten? And they say, I don't know, what are they gonna do, integrated or full day? Nobody nobody knows what's going on. Because, it, <coughs> because it's, it's you can see the dilemma. Right. And as Mr. Boyvin commented, we established policy and Dr. Darty has done his very best to follow that policy. Absolutely. And there is, we cannot, we would like to have the traditional classrooms. We do not have that ability to do that. And clearly, right, we would, if we were doing that and we have one classroom, it would be at one school. And I would venture to say that there would still be people who would be here tonight who hadn't heard the message or were confused about the message and would be unhappy that, that we, we might have made a dis different decision and said, you're all going to kill them from the neighborhood schools. So I think that, it's, it's, Ms. Sporowski highlighted it earlier, it's fundamentally this construct is one that doesn't yield a good solution. And yes, academically, we all agreed here that academically we believe that the traditional model would be stronger and that would be our ideal. Every year in this district with, even, even with the override and the things that we were able to restore and add back, every year in this district there are things that individual parents may view as unmet student needs. We have, at this high school, we have not been able to restore any kind of online learning. Now that may not seem like a lot to, you know, a person in elementary, but that's pretty significant. You know, most high schools have that as an opportunity. So we have this challenge. This is a, this area is really not, I think Ms. Borowski highlighted it, this is a pretty unfavorable position in town. I know most of the people that I talk to, if I mention this, they pretty much shut me down, but the solution is publicly funded full day and making sure that we have the space. Right. And I, you know, what will it take to get our community there? It's going to take a lot, because it's gonna take, uh, a debt exclusion for space and it's going to take an override to get this done and whether other parts of the community outside those who have school age children would ever 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 support that I do not know and we got FinCom here who probably has some ideas about whether they would or they wouldn't so it, certainly in my lifetime in this community I would like to see us get there because the whole the full day started when my 25 year olds were in kindergarten and, and let me I'm not lobbying full day, half day. I'm just saying people want to process. That's what I'm trying to get across. And people want to have a clear understanding of what is going to happen year to year. The wishy-washy back and forth and is driving parents bananas. But Alicia, what I'm saying to you is the process is, as Mr. Boyvin said, we set a policy. You have goals. You try to achieve the goals. Okay. And Dr. Doherty did his very best with the staff and the teachers and the input and understanding what, you know, what went on and did his very best to communicate. I, 
perception is your perception, and I, I cannot, you know, control, deny, or judge that perception. But I, I, I feel like many of us weighed in. I think actually Dr. Doxer and I wordsmithed that letter. Is that true? You both did. Yeah. Yes. Um, so. Well, that actually brings me to my, my next point. The reoccurring theme I hear over and over that is a little frustrating is parents say, well, I didn't see it. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear it. And I, I know we can't, you can lead a horse to water, you can't force him to drink, but I think we need to change something we're doing, communicating to parents. We need to change the way we write a letter. I actually um, received a text message of what the letter looked like, and I looked at it, and it's a lot of words on that letter. And parents, it's, it's true. When you get an email, do you read that whole six paragraph email? No, you don't. You scan it, you look at it, and then you, you delete it or you file it. Things need to be... Can I, this was mailed package, by the way, because it had all the registration forms, so it was a mailed package. And I think, you know, we've, we've struggled with that, but we, we email, we paper mail, we put out notices, we had in-person meetings, all the principals were there, there was lots of dialogue. Um, Dr. Doherty has office hours, the principals all have open, I, you know, I, th I think that we did say, okay, last year, we, there was a, there was a, a uh, uh, there was an ability for us to improve the communication this year, and I think that we did that. And I think there were a number of us on the committee who worked to make sure that that happened. But uh, fundamentally, the committee sets the policy, and Dr. Darty has done his very best to follow that policy. Okay, but you're missing my sort of point where I'm saying the letter that went out, it was a 20-page document probably. It's a pretty thick packet, if I'm not mistaken. If I could, if I could first of all, it was 14 pages, okay. and it was registration material, right. which the cover letter on the first page is when this information, and it was in bold. Right. All of it was in bold. I agree. And I'm not, I'm not so saying I, you did I, anything wrong. No. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. I if I could, if I could speak finish. to the other piece that, that there isn't a good process. So one of the things I've heard loud and clear, and the data shows it, since we started full day kindergarten, is that families want full day kindergarten. And if they don't get full day kindergarten, then they have to look for some other option outside the Reading Public Schools to have a full day e educational experience for their child, whether it be private or whatever the case may be. So as a superintendent, looking at the whole pre-K to 12, I would want students in the Reading Public Schools for as long as we can have them, not to leave in kindergarten and then come back to, at some other point where they don't have the curriculum, where they don't have the experiences that our school district can provide. So that's why that's the number one thing on that list of, I think it's five areas that the school committee and I discussed at the meeting in the fall is that everyone gets, that wants full day K gets full day K. So there is a process. We've been, I followed the process this year. As I said last year, it's a puzzle every year that we have to try to solve. And we do the best we can each year. We have X amount of classrooms, we have X amount of staff, and we do everything we can to, to fulfill as many of those priorities as possible. So there is a process. Okay. I, um, the other, the other question I had for you was, um, you know, RISE does a lottery. I know lotteries aren't popular. What makes the, what's different between RISE and kindergarten and why we do a lottery for one versus the other? The school committee policy basically defines that it doesn't, and that's what we've indicated, that we want to provide full day K to everyone that, that wants it. The policy doesn't say that we will have a lottery. And there, it's many years ago, but there was a lottery. Mr. Boyvin. Obviously, we're only legally required to provide half day. Doesn't mean that right. that's a reason. But yes. some rise students have a different legal criteria. That right, which to. I understand. Which actually leads me to my next question, which is: we have the rise ratios, and I believe the ratio is 15 to 15 students in a classroom. Seven have to be on IEPs. That's actually by law. It's by right. I understand that. Yeah. So my question is: we have this ratio. Is there a law that says we have to educate every child? I, I've kind of done some digging where, I mean, do we just open the, the doors and say every child that wants to come to RISE comes to RISE and we flood the gates and then we have to keep that balance, that ratio? Does anyone understand what I'm trying to say? 
we have to educate every child that requires the services, but then to do that, we have to have an equal, actually more than equal. 5149. 5149 of what we refer to as regular education students. Okay. So you have to have that. Okay, so if you keep getting special ed kids, you have to keep bumping. Yeah. Okay, Which thank you. Which is why the number of clarify. rise classrooms has increased over time. Right. Is because the need, our number of students on IEPs that require services has increased over time. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank yeah. you. Mr. Robinson, one So I'm just I'm kind of thinking on the fly here. We just, I just saw this stuff tonight, so, or this afternoon, so you haven't been looking at it for months, but. What if we, I mean, assuming with there's nothing else we, we can cut out of this budget uh, that we're going to vote on later, what if we, th this is a community priority, right? I mean, full day kinder, I look at it as a community priority. What if we had a discussion with the finance committee about funding the a bus as a community priority? Just an idea. Again, I, as I said, I'm thinking on the fly here because I haven't had a lot of time to go over this. But uh, you know, I don't. I mean, I, I, I mean it, it's you know, a, this affects a lot of people, and to me, that satisfies one of the definitions of a community priority. Now, I don't know what kind of problems that's going to create in the future. But we seem to be on a lot of these things making, the, unfortunately, making decisions on a year to year, year to year basis anyway. So, uh, could that something like that work? I, yeah, I guess I, I'm not I can't, asking. I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to answer that. Yeah, at this, I guess at I'm this not. Point. A, I, I think that's something <laughs> we, we, we need can to, look at as a committee. Eric we need Hart to go it. to the finance committee. <laughs> I don't think we have a quorum. No, and I'm not yeah, asking you this. Yeah, I, I think it's something we need to come to you with. Yeah. Dr. Doxer. Um, two, th two thoughts. Just when, when this is further processed, um, the $64,800 for the bus, um, I actually wonder whether if students are assigned to kill them, whether their parents will actually use that bus. So a question mm. I would have would be, uh, is there a point at which the town is forgiven that law so that if we put the bus in place and no one takes it, can we after a month have justified canceling that bus? The, the law says will. Can't take that risk. Will you can't. <laughs> so it, it's pretty definitive. That. Will whether or not the parents <laughs> want to put the kids on the buses is their own it, decision. There has to be that. We bus. could do it for one child. We would have to. Yeah. Yep. Have a group. Mm -hmm. And the and the other concern that um, Ms. Borowski brought up really clearly is that there's the challenge over integrated day and we still have the concern about those people that will be happy that their kids are in their neighborhood schools and it's a real challenge it's one of those feelings i have very hard to make everybody it's interesting you say that because a year ago we had a different group of people here making the opposite point right <laughs> how do we Mr. Y. Oh, Mr. Boyvin, did you have? Yeah, just, just two quick points. Um, so what the superintendent effectively has is I think of it as a, I don't know if this is possible, a five-sided Rubik's Cube, which really has six sides, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's a five variable equation, right? And, and you've got to solve that depending on the inputs you get for kindergarten enrollment every year. The school committee has tried to guide to solve access to full day first, get that variable such that you optimize access to full day. That's what I hear you saying, and that's what, I, what I've heard. The next thing is optimize for class size. Okay, we can do a second side then, and we can move, move people around. Integrated versus traditional is third. If you want to move that up, I think that's a separate agenda item and a separate yes. thing you, discussion you can have with this committee. If you want to move integrated to the top from some of the people who spoke today, that's absolutely a conversation we should be having as a committee about our policy and guidance, but there's a cost to that. If we do that, what I think we need to have the full discussion with all affected parties about if we move to this system where we say, okay, the first thing is to maintain integrated, uh, not may not have it to traditional instead of integrated, does that mean that not everyone has access right. to full day who might want it? 
we have to provide half day. We don't have a choice in that. That's a legal requirement. So we have, now you don't have to send your kid to half day, but we gotta provide. That's a must. So given that, given the space constraints, there could be other outcomes, right? So every, every solution, if you, if you change the order of what variables you solve for, they're gonna be new, new results and we'll have to discuss. So I think that's a conversation we should have. The, the, the second point that I had was take away that we have a, what I would characterize as a very flexible system right now, so we have guidance, but you know, it's, it's really an administrative matter ultimately about which child attends where. We do have spot redistricting, which we haven't okay. talked a lot about. We talked more about that last week. It's another tool the superintendent has to reassign students. Um, I had some reservations about using that in the way that it was used last year, but we had that conversation. And so if, if we're gonna talk about community priorities or something like that, I, I just think it has to be a fuller um, mm -hmm. discussion. But I think we have to be upfront with the taxpayer, quite frankly, that you could, when you sign your child up for kindergarten, be an integrated or traditional setting. I think, I think that was written, I, don't, I mm -hmm. wasn't at the meeting. But we need to give the really clear examples of this year and next year, right? Of in, in some years, that means that we have half day in only two schools and you don't necessarily get to access half day at your neighborhood school. And in another scenario, you do have half day in all your neighborhood schools, but it means integrated classrooms for everybody, or for many people, right? We just, all of those are possible outcomes. So let's just try to be really explicit mm -hmm. in our communication. Last point is just, I've heard two people say it, this just for me, I, I just, I recall that nobody on this committee put full day kindergarten into the override request. We had multiple meetings on what we could put into it, and Historically, nobody on this committee put that forward. So I, I remember that as well. Thank you. Mr. Wise. Let's see if I can do both at the same time. Uh, Tom Wise, uh, South Street. Yep. I just would like to I'm, I'd like to try to make this the last comment on this item because we, we, have, a, we have to get our budget right, voted tonight. I realize that. Um, so first of all, we've heard people talk about the letter the kindergarten teachers wrote last year. Um, if you don't mind, I'd just like to read a few sentences from that to make it crystal clear, the kindergarten teacher's opinion. I, Mr. Wise, I, I'll do that, but recognize everyone on this committee agrees with that. I know, okay. I appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna go somewhere with that, so I just wanna set the foundation. So, as the 14 current kindergarten teachers were unanimously opposed to the integrated model, we continue to urge the school committee and the community to act in the best educational and developmental interest of our students. The decision to have half day, half and full day kindergarten programs is what is needed. It supports the development of a learning community. The decision to continue the integrated model will truly limit and put a cap on what kindergartners are able to be exposed to and what they are potentially able to achieve. We want you to know that we are committed to giving your children the best opportunity as they start their educational journey in the running public schools. Um, I submit to you that the kindergarten teachers are probably the experts of what kindergarten age students need. That's my submission. Um, and they are saying that they're asking the school committee to change your policy. The policy that full day is number one is the first thing that needs to be adjusted. And I would also ask you that I don't see a policy officially from you guys that says that. You have guidelines, but you do not have an official policy that says that. Um, as I read through your guidelines, it's clear you said one, two, three, four, five, but that is not a policy as it is right now. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is in your packet here, you say, currently we do not have any available classrooms for next year. And we may need additional classroom space for special education programming during the 2021, 2020, 2021 school year. I think we've established in the past that special education is unpredictable. That kids get added to the program relatively frequently, especially towards the beginning of the year that we did not know and we were not anticipating. We've also established in the past that such things led to half classrooms at Joshua Eaton with partitions that led to OCR findings. I submit to you, as you set this right now, you have no space for next year. If you have more kids that are going into, into special education, you will be setting up the district for another OCR finding. Mr. Weiss, I just would like to say, we, we will do our very best, and I think the superintendent has. And 
as you know, you cannot just solve an equation and create space. So clearly, if we get into that situation, we're going to do our best to avoid being in that situation. Um, what, if that means that we have to get rid of art in an elementary school because we have to take over an entire classroom somewhere, then I guess you know those are the kinds of things that we would have to, that not us, Dr. Doherty would look at. But I feel like we are doing the very best we can and the, just the administration will do their very best to serve the needs of, of the students. And Sharon Stewart, I think, has done an excellent job as our interim will be um, looking to a new director, and I'm sure Dr. Darty will communicate those priorities. Yep, I understand that. I just, I feel like you are putting yourself so close to the edge, so close. Thank you. Unnecessarily. If you would listen to the kindergarten teachers who say that we want full and half, and I realize it's a community priority that we want as many, I'm, I had both of my kids go through full day, right? So I realize that. But going back to the minutes in 2011, there was a lottery. This town had a lottery before, and Elaine, you just, Mrs. Uh, Ward, you just said the we, same. We thing. never had the lottery in 2011. It was prior to 2000. It was very early on. In in uh, my kids were in kindergarten in 2000, 2001, two, three, four. So Tom, I've not had a lottery since I've been superintendent. Uh, I you may not have had to, but on February on January 13th of 2011, the minute said, Dr. Doherty handed out an updated enrollment projection for the next school year. He appointed that the incoming kindergarten numbers were, were based solely on the census. Kindergarten registration is currently underway, and full day lottery will be Tuesday. That, that is true. That is true. We were talking about having a lottery, but we never had the lottery. We've not had a lottery in the have time that I've been superintendent. Fortunate to not have to do it, right. but the right. construct is there to do it if you need to. Thank you. I'd like to move on to the FY20 budget. Did you talk about um, the initial <coughs> presentation? I know it all. Hang on. Oh, on the on the um, the item where you received the mail. The rise. Sorry, music teachers. Were you going to make? Oh roll? yes. Yeah. Thank sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I know there's been a lot of discussion, um, and the committee has received emails regarding the 0.6 uh, rise position. And there's a couple of things that I want to clarify um, for the, the committee um, that has discussions about the, the budget. So first of all, I, I think there's been some confusion in the community that the position is getting cut. The position is not getting cut. The position is not in the current budget, so it would not be in next year's budget. It was a position that was cut a couple of years ago. It was not part of the override funding. Um, and we unfortunately cannot have put everything in the override proposal. And there were things that we actually had to take out uh, once we knew what the uh, select board had put forward as, as, a, as a number for the, for the funding. And there are other things that have been cut over the years that were not put um, that have not been pack, put back in this budget. And you mentioned, um, Mrs. Webb, the virtual high school mm -hmm. piece, which is something that we, we still do not have. And that was one of the things that was cut. So that I just want to clarify that piece. In conversations that I had with, and I've had with um, Ms. Boswick uh, regarding the music, so music is integrated throughout the entire day in the classrooms. It's not uncommon on a regular basis for teachers, um, both in physical education classes and in the general, cl the integrated classrooms, um, to be using songs as part of their curriculum. It is a regular part of the day now. The teachers, the classroom teachers use music. Um, in addition, the RISE PTN has music enrichment going on throughout the year. So um, they've had October, November, January, February, and March, there have been enrichment programs around music that are scheduled uh, or have already <coughs> occurred. And those, those have been funded by the, the RISE PTN. Um, so those, I think, I think it's important to note that music is an integrated piece of this. 
and I know that Sharon can also speak a little bit about um, this piece as well in terms of services and, and things like that. I mean, the, I don't think there's a dispute regarding how helpful music is for young children. I, I don't think anyone really disputes some of the points that folks have made. Um, I think that music as part of your preschool curriculum is an important aspect for all of the teachers to be incorporating into their activities, their lessons, their learning stations, and that I would probably recommend more of a consult model for staff at the RISE Preschool for ways they can really enhance what they're doing through music as opposed to a direct 30-minute uh, lesson as part of their three-hour day or four-hour day. Um, I think it would be more beneficial for it to be in shorter spurts and integrated throughout all of the activities rather than one lesson once a week. Um, I think there'd be greater benefit through a consult model. That would be my recommendation. If I can also just talk in general about, it, which does connect to the RISE piece, but I think is a more global comment about the FY20 budget. Um, something that we didn't talk about and we just didn't feel that it was warranted the year after an override has passed is that there have been numerous discussions internally about other positions that our, our principals have felt should be in this budget that we have not funded in this budget. And we had to have a lot of conversations uh, both with special education positions and with regular education positions mm -hmm. that we've told principals, unfortunately, we just don't have the funding to fund those positions. And they're all important positions. But when it was all said and done, we had to choose the absolute most critical positions moving forward in the district. And that was based on really two factors. One is class size and making sure that we meet the needs of the children's IEPs. There are no other additional positions in this budget outside of those two areas. Um, so I think it's important to note that we, when we put these budgets together and we, we are taking a look at every single aspect and having numerous conversations at many different levels um, as, as we're putting this together over a several month period. questions from committee members, um, any discussions on the, the budget? Um, I think I'd like to have a little bit of discussion first before I ask Dr. Doxer to read a motion. I had thought, oh, Dr. Doxer, go ahead. I, w I was just going to sort of reiterate part of what Dr. Doherty said. When we were discussing the override numbers, we had our blue sky numbers, and then we brought that back down into what the town might support. And then those numbers that we thought the town might support got cut even more for the ultimate override vote. And the reality was that there are conflicts compromises still being made, but we are very fortunate amongst our, uh, our neighboring towns that we did, thank you, citizens of Reading, pass the override so that we have a level funded budget this year. Um, but as was stated, the reality was we had a lot more needs that would we thought would help our students, not numbers, students, but we couldn't do everything because there are lots of different needs in our town from senior citizens and those with different amounts of um, available money, et cetera. So the override was the best we could do and that's what we're trying to do now. It's the best that we can do with the generosity that was evident from our town. I actually had a um, statement that I just sort of wanted to recap um, for the committee members, but um, 
and it sort of aligns, you know, we have fiscal management policies, which I know everyone has looked at, and um, I should thank Mrs. Engelson for my policy book, which I use frequently. Um, but, you know, our goal is to create a sustainable budget. And one of the things that's been a focus of some of our conversations is assuring that all of the, the FTEs, especially, that we add or we reallocate are focused on the things that we need to do legally, that we're mandated to do to support students, and to address the needs of all of our students across any aspect of the curriculum. Um, meeting the student needs, as we've talked about a lot, um, this, this budget cycle is requiring more resources, whether those students are special education students or students that might be dealing with um, some type of, of injury or medical issue as they return to school or, or um, some particular trauma issue. Um, I don't know if Joanne King is still here. Is she still? She's here. She's here in the back corner. Very, very significant event in our Wood End community um, this weekend that, that creates um, the need for our teachers and our specialists to be so supportive and so aware. And as before the meeting started, I heard our um, middle school principals offering their support to their elementary principal to say, we'll do whatever we, we, we understand that your, um, your staff is going to need to be with the students or need to be at this wake, and we're going to be there. And we're not elementary experts, but we're going to be there. So I think even that in our district highlights um, how schools and school environments and teachers and administrators and paras and specialists respond to these kinds of events. That it, it was not that way when I went to RMHS or my elementary school. So I think we recognize, we recognize that every time we make a decision to add an FTE, and we've talked about the FTEs drive the budget, and when we add an FTE um, in our, our teachers, we, we provide a COLA, they get steps and columns. These, these raises are not insignificant, they are significant because the steps are almost twice, uh, close to twice the COLA. So we have to make these decisions very judiciously, but we have to recognize that they are driven by a student need. I think our collective process in Reading is really quite incredible. And we have new administrators, um, Sharon and Chris, and Gail is relatively new, though maybe hadn't seen school processes before, <laughs> and Kate and Jen. So who basically see this process and see that the superintendent goes through this analysis pro process. He, he delivers his recommended budget. We analyze it. We go through presentations. We have a public hearing. We then come to this evening where we take a vote. It's detailed. It's rigorous. Rigorous. It begins in late September, early October. This year, there was, there was, we were sort of behind where we could start because our negotiations process took longer to settle to November. Um, the process includes one-on-ones with, if people don't know this, our, our CFO, Gail Dowd, sits one-on-one -on -one with the principals. And this is, you know, I don't know how many other people in corporate America, but I, it's uncomfortable when I'm sitting with my finance person, too. So, um, so intimidating. The principals have to sort of sit through that process. Then they meet with the superintendent uh, as, and Chris, this team right yeah. here, that each individually meet with the principals. Then the whole leadership team meets together multiple times. It's iterative process. This is a collaboration and an inspection of really every FTE, every expense item to ask themselves, what do we need to support our students? What is essential? What is essential to make sure that when students leave this high school, they are well prepared for college and their and career, but for college, for the largest percentage of our students. So the public process includes all of you here, people who listen, who come to the meetings, who send us email, our budget liaisons, who are all, have always been important to us in terms of getting feedback to Dr. Darty and the team. Um, and I think that 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 rigor, sometimes it may feel like to us, and I don't know why it feels this way, but it feels like sort of, okay, now we're at this one meeting and I, I have to sort of, now I have to make this decision. So it, 
I wanted to take a minute to reflect on the fact that this is a very long and um, detailed process. And it's not to say that we, we can always look for ways to improve that process. And um, you know, I look forward to feedback from my fellow committee members at the end of the cycle um, to say, you know, where could we, we do this better? We've changed our process with FinCom over the years. Appreciate you being here. I know some of your other members are watching this exciting TV. Um, but we, you know, changed that process as well so that FinCom can really see um, in a more uh, dramatic and firsthand way the struggles that we go through in the dialogue. I think we got a couple members here tonight. So um, with that said, I know, and also the, you know, we all ask our questions in the meetings. Um, Dr. Garrity, over the last uh, three years, there's been 89, 72, and 100 or 101 questions, um, you know, written because sometimes it helps for us to see them in writing and have that, we might want that written record. It helps when we, um, for our own learning on how to really evaluate the budget. So I just wanted to say that I appreciate um, all of that. I know our administrators have been here, principals have been here with us over the last couple of meetings. Um, and yep, just wanna give, I wanna just set that frame and give people an opportunity to ask additional questions. And then I think we'll put the motion on the table. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. Uh, the, the, uh, I guess to Dr. Doherty and Sharon. Uh, so, you know, we had a, some lively conversation on the, the music thing. Uh, but my question is whether we, we can get a, you went, you went through a lot of the things that, that are apparently being done. If we could get a, you know, some toward, sort of communication with the parents or a white paper or whatever that shows that there is some music because there's a disconnect if people are, or, or residents are saying there isn't. Uh, or they've lost it, but you know, you just articulated that there's there's things going on all day long, and I think it's important to, as part of a response to that, put that out there as to what's going on. I think you mentioned uh, the PTNs or PTN. It, well, yeah, it's the PTO essentially. And, it is and yeah. and some of the things that Sharon just said. I think it's important that 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 gets communicated because, you know, it, there's, there's residents that don't know that, that don't think that's happening. I guess. We, we can certainly have Mrs. Boswick send something out to the parents to communicate. Ms. Brasky, thank you. Um, I just have a couple quick things. Um, I don't have any questions at this point. I've asked a lot over the last few weeks. I submitted several in writing. Um, so I just wanted to, and it's somewhat repetitive, but I did want to thank everyone on the staff, especially Ms. Dowd for the work that she did. But I also, um, oh, and I wanted to mention that for those of us who've been at this for a few years, I find that the budget is far more readable now than it was six years ago. And that's an every year process. It wasn't like one radical change, but every year there's a real thoughtfulness about what information needs to be here, what's the best way to present it. So, um, so I appreciate that, that kind of continuous improvement and always trying to make it better. Um, but I also wanted to thank the four of you because it happens every year and it happened again this year. Reading the questions that you submitted always makes me think uh, there's always a few that I go, ooh, that's an interesting thought and a different way of looking at it. So thank you for, for your work because it really helped me in my thinking. Um, and I guess my only comment on this budget, for me, the most important thing about the FY20 budget, the single most important thing, um, is the chart on page four um, where Dr. Doherty articulates that this budget is in full compliance with all the commitments we made during the override process. I think, as Dr. Doxer said, always being cognizant of the generosity and the trust in us by the taxpayers of this town to say yes we will all raise our property taxes to support our schools we said we would spend the money in the following ways and i really appreciate that this budget lays out and we have done everything we said we would do um, so i appreciate the clarity on that because i think it's really a very important point thank you mr boyden yeah i would just add a couple things to the last points mr robinson Ms. Baraski. so first of all the um Ms. Baraski, your point just Gail, I really like figure two. Keep, uh, it's a nice job. It really itemizes for the, for the taxpayer exactly what they've, they've supported and invested in in our schools, tells you exactly where the override money is. Legally, I don't believe we have an obligation to provide that after the first year, which we just passed, but we continue to provide that as we promised we would, so it's promise kept, and I want to 
thank you for doing that extra work in Figgy Seed. Please keep that in the budget book. Um, the budget book has gotten much more streamlined in my three years here. I do appreciate that. For me, just to give you some feedback, Gail, the drivers are like figure 10, the master budget sheet. That's, that's the first place I go in this book. The second place I go, that's the money. And the second place I go is the time, which is the FTE table in figure 12. My only suggestion is when I went back through some older budget books, I think there was a different font or presentation or shading where it was more clear where it's kind of an inverse way of presenting information where you show the subtotal at the top and then you itemize below and it's really more like something where you click and you open up a set of like subfolders. But for someone reading it for the first time, it's a little hard to follow. So if you look back a couple budget books, there was a template that I thought was a little more readable, a different shading for the sub. Total, so like regular day, it would have a, a, a different shading, and then all the items, and it will be right justified under regular day, so you can really clearly see that relationship. Um, the questions that um, were mentioned, I, I do like the question approach. I like that they were anonymized this year, personally, uh, and grouped by topic. I really like that. I really don't know who asked what. That's. I, I, yeah. I, I like. I, I just. I, I just find that when you group like. Sorry, to interrupt, when you group like questions together. I find, I always try to guess which of you <laughs> the other thing. I personally, I'm glad that I don't exactly know, but, but that process that I know that we submit a lot of questions and I think the voters elected us to do that and I appreciate you supporting that, that effort as you know, us as volunteers and you put a lot of extra time above and beyond to really help the voter. Uh, we're here to help the voter get the information about the school budget, make that accessible. We're trying to do that. We can't do it without you, so I wanna thank all of you, all of you worked on that, I know, so. I, yes, I just that I think that that organization will also be very helpful to FinCon because they're, they're on to their process, and so grouping them by category, I think really is helpful because they can read that and instead of being sort of all over. So, so if any committee members were feeling like, oh, my questions, now nobody can tell which questions I ask, I appreciate it. It really does serve uh, the process more effectively. Dr. Doxer. I, I just, I appreciate that part of our job is to make sure that the voters understand and can follow the process or an invo are involved and able to give their opinions. Um, my caution is that there's only so much time in a day and in a week and I want to make sure that we're very cognizant of the way our administrators are spending their time and keeping themselves or getting themselves healthy. Um, because the students are our primary focus here and they need to stay the primary focus when we're working on a budget, when we're answering questions, when we're working out what we can spend and what we can't, that enters into the bandwidth of our administrators and where their time goes. And so I'm so appreciative of the Herculean effort that has been put into the continual improvement in the budget book and the numbers that are available to us and the extra effort it puts, you put in to give us the answers to our questions. I just want us as a school committee and a town to be really cognizant of the amount of time also that it takes to stay in touch with the students and make sure that our budget is answering the needs enabling our administrators to focus on the needs of their students. And I think that our administrators have been doing that. They're doing all of it. But we get, I'm concerned sometimes we get spoiled and then we keep asking for more. And I want to make sure this process stays doable and, f and our school district stays focused on our children. And so I don't, I don't know how to finish that sentence except thank you for doing what you do because you're doing both sides of it. But I think that it's our job to try to keep in mind the bandwidth that our administrators and our teachers have and keep their jobs doable and support our teachers and our administrators in staying connected with the students. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to ask Dr. Doxer to read the motion at this point. 
Um, I move to approve the FY 2020 school department budget in the amount of, is that the number? Yep. $46,467,348. Mrs. Dowd, got that right? Is that the yeah. um, can I get a second? No, I don't think I can second. <laughs> <laughs> You want to, but I Mr. Boyd. I thought that she was asking. Did you have Second. another? No, she was asking if I seconded by Mr. Boyd. Yes. Um, do we have any further discussion? Mr. Boyd. So, just a few observations on this budget that when I went through to share with the committee, some of some of my concerns, I'm, I'm leaning toward supporting it. I want to hear what others think, um, but never. This is going to sound like a strong statement, but I think it's true. Um, never have we had more FTE in a budget for fewer students. This is the most for the least. So we have 584 FTE here for the lowest enrollment in 17 years. Okay, and that's I only have what's in the budget book. I mean, I don't know beyond that, but that's factually I think that's correct. And I don't want to. That doesn't mean that's wrong. That doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do or that I don't support it. It's just, we need to be very careful, I think, of two things. I think our discussions have drawn these things out, but if there was a time to ask more questions, this is it. Are we using every moment of time that we invest in those 4,200 students to its maximum effect? And it's not that the intent from the superintendent isn't to do that, it's that we were elected to work with the superintendent to make sure that all of our perspectives are part of mm -hmm. making sure that that's true, right? So now I want to put that in perspective a little bit that the lowest enrollment isn't by a lot. We're 6% under the highest enrollment, right? So it's, you know, 6% to the highest number I see in the public budget book up from what we have. So it's not like we have massive swings in enrollment, but we are, we are investing heavily in, in um, in our, in our students in, in our district. Um, the other thing that, second point uh, observation, this is a 3.6% increase over last year. That is one of the lowest increases year over year we've had for level service going back to, I don't know, I think FY 12, 11, one of the early mm -hmm. budget books. It's been a long time since we've been this low in year over year increases. Um, I, my, I think it's important that we continue to work with the Finance Committee to make sure that the projections of what the rates of growth are are realistic and in line with what you can expect from 584 FTE that we're putting into this district if this is what we vote on. Because in the last five years, that's not what we've seen. You know, we've seen 4.7, 4.6, 4.5% growth for level service. We've had lower rates of growth because of cuts. Mm -hmm. And so looking at those cuts, my third comment, we cut about $2.26, $2.5 5 million out of the school budget over about three years. We put back 50% of, 56% of that with the override. Right. Right. So we didn't put back everything, right? We put back what, you know, this committee felt was the most appropriate request for the political process that is inherently what an override is to make our case to the select board. Um, so, this is the time to really think, right? That my, my, my con long term concern is that you know, I would hate to see us return to growth rates that are higher than projected, especially if they're much higher than projected. And, and, and I, you know, I'm concerned that if, if we don't align and kind of somehow have earlier conversations before the budget cycle around strategic planning, that you know, if there's a 1% difference between what the FinCom guides to in growth and, and what we actually have in our district that could have a major impact on students and learning, mm -hmm. as we've seen in the past. It sounds like a small number, but on a $46 million base, that's $460,000 gap, right? So I'm kind of, I'm cautiously optimistic, but those are real challenges for us as a district. And the last thing I'd point out is, you know, we take the district improvement plan uh, three years at a time. We take the superintendent goals, I've spoken separately about that, but we as a committee take a three-year approach to superintendent goals historically. Um, I'd like to see a multi-year approach to strategic planning in the budget. We've taken a one-year approach to budgets, and the law requires us to evaluate the superintendent every year, and we have no problem saying that's a three-year process, and yet we turn in recommendations every year. 
The law says we have to recommend a budget every year, and we do that. And yet, every year, and we open up the box in January, and we have a whole bunch of meetings, and here we are, and we gotta vote four weeks later. It's hard to do strategic planning under that kind of time schedule. So anything we can do to open the process up of the, the long-term projections in, in partnership with our, our town manager, our, our finance committee, this is this, particularly in the special ed area, we have some real challenges that aren't unique to Reading. You know, the cost of a third of our special ed budget is out of district, and those costs are going up in ways we can't completely control. Um, we still have about 60 students who need out-of-district placement. Um, so, and then the special ed, you know, overall is going up 7%, yeah, in, in terms of its overall cost. So those, those were my observations. That's, that's my list. <laughs> so I'm eager to hear what others have to say. Ms. Borowski, um, I have two, two points. Thank you for that. That was thought-provoking. Um, you shared some thoughts about what might improve the budget going forward, and since you did, I'll, I'll throw that out there too. I included this as one of my questions, so now you know one of those questions was, the, this one was mine. Um, <laughs> but I, I, um, I, for instance, you're saying what would make it better. I would like to find a, a different or better way to do offsets so that you can more easily see what the real expenses are, because I find myself backing them out so that you can really see the, co the expense cost over time, how it's changing, because if one year you use a particularly generous offset, or one year you can't, it can really skew and if you don't know that, it can really skew. So that's just a for instance of something I'd like to look at down the road. Um, I think you made a really good point about FTEs, and it is absolutely accurate statement to make. We have the highest number of FTEs for the lowest number of students. Completely correct. But looking at that chart that you referenced earlier that you like so much, figure 12, it's really, I think, vital when you make that statement to clarify where that FTE growth is. So when I look at this, the administrative FTE is exactly where it was in FY16. There was a cut, it was unsustainable, it wasn't working, we put it back, but th that's flat. Um, if you look at regular day education, um, we're actually down five FTEs. That to me would reflect enrollment changes. Enrollment went down a little bit, FTEs went down a little bit. Um, if you look at athletics, it's the same. If you look at extracurriculars, it's the same. Health services is the same. If you look at special education, it's up 20.4 FTEs. So it's to me very, very clear where that FTE growth is happening and it's very clear that it's happening in a place that's mandated. It's not discretionary in the way that much of regular day is. Right. I just think it's an important point, to, to, point. To, to clarify. Great point. Yeah, I think um, based on questions, Dr. Darty and Ms. Borowski had asked a question and we have this, this chart has the over the last five years sort of shows that much better than I just did. I think that that point is that, again, it's, we've highlighted this discussion and we, we have had, have already started that discussion with, around special education. And again, it's driven by student need and we have to really be looking at what is that going to mean going forward about how we plan to fund the district. Is there any other? Oh, Dr. Doxer and then I'll go back to Mr. Brady. I just, um, I also was focusing on the FTE question, and I just want to reinforce that our most important resources are our teachers. And the student needs, we, we see how it parses apart, but on the everyday, using every minute, as you said, that the way every minute is used is not necessarily towards standardized test scores or towards um, academics. We are dealing with real people who are real teachers and real students who are real people and real families who are real people. I know it sounds redundant, but using every minute also means leaving enough time for their needs to be dealt with, for the learning to be meaningful, to, for questions to be pursued, and for students and teachers to find the joy in learning and teaching. And the more we crunch in to their space and their time and on their backs, the less joy there is, the less time there is to follow meaningful learning, and the less, the poorer the foundations, which potentially even contribute towards 
the needs that ultimately need to be addressed. And so I think that when we are looking forward, we have to keep at the forefront of our minds our most important resources, our teachers, and give them the opportunity. And sometimes that requires more FTEs. We have the guidelines on our class sizes as a start to that. It's a basic, but it's important. The more kids and the more needs in each of our teachers' classrooms and the more demands and the more constant changes, the less joy they're going to find and the less connection they're able to build with their students. And those are the really the most powerful learning agents in for our students and our teachers going forward is those relationships and those special joyous moments and those moments where they cry together and they get off the bandwagon and deal with the everyday realities that people are dealing with. We challenge day, I've done it at least four times. And what our students are dealing with now, I would never have fathomed that they're coming to school with these backpacks full of things other than their books. And our teachers are their point of grounding. And we need to leave time and that means we can't scrimp on the FTEs and we can't scrimp on the space. So going forward, I don't think we should be counting the, the FTE minutes. I think we should be reveling in our kids and, and trying to support our teachers in meeting their needs. And, and that's not to say that we don't have a very real tangible challenge with our budgets. But going to the easy places and counting numbers is not the way to provide an education. Mr. Robinson. So I guess the only thing I'll add is, and you know, just from a historical perspective, uh, and I think I said this the other night, when I first came on the committee, we had one, uh, we had the DLC program. Mm -hmm. And now we have six <coughs> programs. Six or seven, yeah. Uh, so, and that's, and as I've been on the committee, that's just, that's the area that's grown every year. And I think, and, and that was one of my questions. I really think it's time, uh, and I'm not saying don't let it keep growing, but I really think it's time we just take a step back. And, and we started to do that last year with one of, with one of the program reviews, but I think we need to, to look at all of the programs again, and I think that was one of my questions. And not that we're gonna, you know, not that we change anything, but we, we just can't, every, maybe if we find things, but we won't have to continue to add FTEs to a program because we can figure out a way to do something better or, uh, but I really think that that's what's growing and it's that's what's been growing and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to, to I think, take a step back and evaluate that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Borden. Yeah, a couple of quick points for things that other people have said. Um, so Ms. Baresk's point about um, FTEs and regular day, I actually found that um, when I plugged into Excel the number of FTE for just regular day for the last five six years, so whatever I had available to me, and it goes back to FY14. And I added in any of these reductions, so I just looked at the level service FTE for regular day, and I plotted that against enrollment. <laughs> there, there is a nice trend where if you see enrollment go up, then the following year regular day goes up, and when you see enrollment go down, the following year enrollment goes down, or, or regular FTE goes down. So we do have this kind of like, I like to say, like kind of dolphin chasing the boat, where, nice image, um, where when enrollment goes up, you would expect staffing to go up in regular day, and when enrollment goes down, it does come back down. So there is a responsiveness that at least may be there and appears to be there, which is appropriate for, um, it's not like we just hire, hire and hire and hire, and we never like kind of look at what the need yeah. is. I think there is evidence that that is, feedback loop is occurring. Um, so that's one point. Second point is uh, Dr. Doctor's point about the joy in learning. Um, I, I, I think, what I thought of there was just the importance of kind of looking at and getting 
separate conversation, I know, but there's a budget connection to getting feedback from teachers and staff about what's working with their time for students. We do expect a lot of our teachers. We do a lot of work. We, we have a lot of great presentations and information we get. What we don't really get is the collective impact on the ground, right? So we have data coaches at some points. We have data gathering. We do uh, all kinds of efforts to um, creatively meet students in this MTSS framework in level one, two, three. And, and that all really sounds good from our perspective, kind of detached from, from the classroom when we're having <coughs> these meetings. I just want to make sure that w there is a loop to the superintendent. I think there is through the building principals, but I want to say it's important for building principals and, and staff just to continue to you know, listen to those in, in the classroom who are you know, taking these FTEs and turning it into a learning experience and, and make sure that we're, they might have ideas of how we could target professional development or mm -hmm. maybe we're doing great and that's good, that's great feedback. Maybe things are fine as they are. Um, 80, like I said, another statistic I had before, 82% of the budget is salary, right? So our, our time is is 82% salary and that's the budget. And when you look at the actuals, it's 83 or 84. It's actually a little higher on the actuals than it is on the plan. So this is really important, kind of auditing our time is kind of, that is what the, I think the future of stewardship of taxpayer money looks like. It looks more like us auditing making sure, and I think we had some great discussions on special ed, Ms. Stewart and, and Gail, and you know, having gone through all of the different student requirements and making sure that, that every FT in there is addressing a, a student need. So I think there's a lot of good things going on and I don't, I don't want to not state those because mm -hmm. they're not a problem, maybe. No further discussion. We'll we any ready to take it to a vote? Um, the motion was made and seconded to approve the FY20 school department budget in the amount of forty-six million four hundred sixty seven thousand three hundred forty-eight dollars. This is the superintendent's recommended budget. And school committee. Yep. Which to become the school committee budget. Ready for a vote? Right. All those in favor? Any opposed? Five zero. I have one other um, short item. I know that um, oh, Mora left, I believe, but Mora highlighted um, something that our um, Sue Gilbert, our art teacher here at the high school, has done the memory project. And um, Dr. Darty, for people who don't know, he produces something called The Journey, which I think is on volume 10. Am I right? Yes. Pathways. And, and yeah, pathways. And pathways. Pathways to the community. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, he highlighted this and included a video clip. And um, I don't usually have time to, to do that. And I think when you read about in the, in the journey or the pathways what the memory project was, you know, you can read it and <coughs> get a little sense of it. But I'd like to um, have Dr. Darty show that video. Yeah, the challenge is we don't have sound. We'll have to try to figure this out. No, there's sound on the laptop. Yeah, but you won't be able to hear me. Uh, we'll have to put the microphone. Will one of the on. mics fit. Bring a microphone over. Because it's a labyrinth trying to get over to the. Uh, so if we get the video going, this recognize that long. this is the the art. Sue Gilbert and the uh, high school art team completed the program last year. Do you want this one too? I think these are battery powered. And, um, and they're for our CTV. I'll hold it.
cute. Oh my god. <laughs> I just want to start with a big thank you for everyone who took part in this project. Um, uh, what you have done for these children is very special. For these children, there are a lot of donations, financial donations that comes for the facilities and everything else. They're very important, but um, they lack the special touch that you guys have provided in this project. What you have done, uh, you have showed these children that there are uh, uh, people on the other side of the world that really cares, and that will change their future. Um, what I've seen yesterday is that the love that you sent for them has lit up their heart, and I saw that on their faces. So, really, thank you for everything that you have done. Uh, these Syrian refugees have uh, suffered a lot, and uh, for them uh, to see uh, their photos and their portraits uh, in such a way uh, just puts a smile on their faces. Thank you very much. Hello, 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 بالوقت اللي احنا بنوزع فيه كنا ملفات الصور كان بتوزع عليهم الفرح والسرور على وجود طلابنا. هالفكره من المشروع كانت كثير رائعه انه في شخص ما في مكان ما عم بفكر بمعاناه الطلاب عم بيلعبهم معنويا بيرسم لهم ابتسامه بانها تطلبوا ومن هون بنحكي 
So, um, yeah. I know that that was an unusual way to end the school committee meeting. And I think that I will cry every time I watch that. But I am I'm grateful for this district, for Sue Gilbert, for our students, and for all of the people around Sue Gilbert and these students and these buildings that create that. And it's, um, we have our difficulties and we end up on opposite sides of tables and in each other's faces sometimes. And we are truly blessed and we're, we're blessed to be able to contribute to those children's smiles. And so I just really wanted to, I'm, thank you for letting me share that with everyone this evening and um, thank you. So um, we're gonna adjourn, motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn. Okay. All those in favor? There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.